Uh, it's really a wonderful, wonderful honor uh, to introduce Mark Steiner. It's, it's an honor that I, I asked for. Uh, the wonderful Breaking Ground faculty over here uh, let me introduce Mark. Uh, and and my, my main argument for why I get to do it is, well, I've known him for 15 years, uh, even if he hasn't necessarily known me. I moved here in 1999, and listening to the Mark Steiner show, then on uh, WJHU, was how I learned about Baltimore. I drove back and forth from Charles Village uh, to school here, and I uh, learned about the political and cultural social landscape of Baltimore and, and, and Maryland by listening to this wonderful uh, public affairs, cultural affairs, call-in public radio show. Uh, the very first time I was ever interviewed as sort of like the expert on a radio show was the next year, 2000, in Mark Steiner's show. Aaron Hankin was his producer then. Uh, that was a wonderful uh, highlight uh, moment for me. And then since then, I've got to know him in a variety of ways. Um, you're going to learn a little bit about him today uh, from, from a short video, uh, so I won't, I won't uh, be too duplicative. But I would like to say a couple things that strike me about Mark Steiner's career in radio and before that in education, in activism, in theater, um, is that he, he sort of epitomizes a lot of things that I think the, the Breaking Ground Initiative uh, uh, really is also trying to do. And, and I think uh, maybe should be models for liberal arts education and for being citizens in the world. And those are working across boundaries. Um, that is a kind of thing that we, we talk about in terms of uh, interdisciplinarity. That's one of those words that gets said so often we don't know what it means. But uh, I want you to think about a person who challenged boundaries that were enforced by law, custom, and violence, uh, racial boundaries, the boundaries between rich and poor. And I think the first boundary that Mark Steiner challenged in his life was the boundary separating adults from children. The idea that you aren't really a serious person unless you're an adult. He was a child, uh, he was a leader as a child, and once he became an adult, he consistently turns to youth as serious people and people deserving respect and engagement. And I think that's another really important and overlooked boundary crossing um, that we want to keep in mind. And again, boundary crossing, that sounds trendy. Imagine it when those boundaries are enforced by the weight of law, by the weight of custom, by the weight of violence somebody who gets kicked out of high school because he's uh, fighting for civil rights, facing uh, those kind of odds. Th this is the kind of person we're talking about, somebody who challenges boundaries even when it's dangerous and before it's cool to. The other I issue would be always a student. And again, lifelong learner has become a kind of a cliche, but here's a guy who's always learning, always curious. Again, that's the kind of thing I'm noticing in these breaking ground classes. The faculty are not taking the easy way out. They're not just putting the, move, the, the class in the can and expecting the students to take the easy way out, which is to learn the things in the can and spit it back out. You're making knowledge and investigating things, and it's, tire, it's, it's tiring, it's exhausting, and, um, and Mark has done that throughout his career. And then the, finally, um, uh, on this idea of interdisciplinarity, um, whenever he had a chance, Mark would bring together theater, social work, teaching, uh, social causes. It, you know, if he's in a prison, he makes a theater show, a troupe in the prison. If he's in a poor people's uh, movement group uh, outreach in the street, he's making theater. He's always bringing the, create, the creative arts into social action, and he's bringing education into whatever he does. So I think that's another kind of radical interdisciplinarity um, that I think we could all learn from. And I think you guys are learning from, those of you who are involved in these cool courses. And then the last thing I, I guess I was going to say is this commitment to working uh, on issues of importance to youth, the poor, the imprisoned, the silenced, the marginalized. Uh, that kind of work is also incredibly important. Um, and again, is work I, I think is worthy of um, an honors university in Maryland. So it is my great pleasure to introduce Mark Steiner. Thank you. Hello, everybody. So um, I was giving these instructions about what to talk about uh, and these five areas, which I'll do. But I thought we'd just start this. Valerie produced this video for the celebration we had called 2050. It was last year, the 20th anniversary on the air, and 50 years of social activism. It was actually more than 50 years, but 50 fit better than 55 or whatever that would be. And so um, so they, 
produce this piece. And I thought rather than just sit me and talk about me completely like that, because I get bored talking about myself, um, we'll show this. It'll take like 13, 14 minutes, and then I'll jump in and pick up from this point and talk about all the other issues. Is that all right? Cool. All right. So I hope that wasn't too boring. But <laughs> they wanted to talk a little about me, and I just thought I'd play that to a little bit about where I come from and the stuff that I did in the past and what it led to, because um, somebody wanted me to say well, how we got into radio, and it was a total accident, as we just saw. I didn't plan to go on radio. Um, never thought about going on radio. Well, I did think about it. But when they gave me the chance, we went after it. And I think that what we did, which is important, I think, when you think about anything you do, is we filled a vacuum. And the vacuum we filled was that almost every other radio program in town was either conservative, really conservative to the right, um, and there was a hole that we filled. The hole we filled was a radio that was committed to crossing racial boundaries, class boundaries, uh, issues of gender, bringing people in, talking about social justice, human rights, people's rights, giving poor people a platform on the air, and that's important to me. I mean, that's otherwise, you know, you could, it, 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 because the way media is changing now, you know, when, when, when we grew up, there was a man named Walter Cronkite. And Walter Cronkite was uh, this guy everybody looked to because he came out of Edward R. Murrow's world, who was another great journalist in the late 40s and early 50s and 60s. And they became the embodiment of what journalism should be. And it was easier then, in some, some ways easier then, because people talk about how the media is like broken up the little teeny spots now. There's people in the right Listen, their uh, media, people left theirs, black folks theirs, everybody has their own little piece of the pie. But part of the reason for that is, and the why people like Edward R. Murrow could do what he did, why Walter Cronkite and Harry Reasoner could do what they did, was because the goodwill people in the 40s and 50s were all white men who might not have agreed with each other, conservative and liberal, but they were part of the same club. So they could always find their middle ground. And their middle ground was what people say, we, need, we want to go find this middle ground again. We may have a long time trying to find that again, whether it's in the work you're going to do, doing now or anywhere else. Because what happened with, with America was America changed. America changed in the 50s when the Civil Rights Movement began, and which actually started in the 40s when the black veterans came home from World War II and began standing up for their rights and the rights of their communities. And so we all grew up with this mythology that George Washington cut down the cherry tree, uh, never told a lie, and all the other lies that we were told. And those myths that we grew up with that gave us sort of a unity were torn asunder because A, segregation was being fought, and it exposed the tyranny of race and racism in America and led to the development of a black leadership that spoke to the country. Somebody like Michael Harrington came along, who was a crusading writer and journalist, uh, who wrote a book called The Other America. And that came out in 5960, and that exposed poverty in America. Nobody thought about poverty in America, unless you were poor. But it exposed the poverty in Appalachia, it exposed the poverty in Harlem and Chicago, and across this country. That began to be exposed. And the Vietnam War happened. And then that generation that began struggling in the Civil Rights Movement began to look at this war questioning, well, why are we going to war? Why are we fighting the Vietnamese? For what? Well, I mean, this is not World War II. You know, when you know, the Nazis were going to come and we had to fight them to stop them from coming here and killing the rest of the world and killing Jews and blacks and everybody else. So people questioned that war and they stood up against the war and contradictions about that war and the kind of the way America told lies about that war from the Gulf of Tonkin. That was a time when the, the, they said that the Vietnamese attacked the Americans in the Gulf of Tonkin, which was part of where Vietnam is, northern Vietnam. And it turned out that was a lie. Uh, that never happened. Daniel Ellsberg put out this book, the Pentagon Papers, that ended up showing America that the whole reason we got into the war was a lie. So the anti-war movement exploded. And the women's movement began to grow at that period. 
Um, and the women's movement began to change consciousness of America. All of a sudden, women were no longer saying, I'll give you an example. This all leads back to journalism. The, is that, I remember in our movement, I remember the time when women in our movements got up before this auditorium full of men and women, all in our 20s, talking about they wanted women's rights and they weren't going to do all the typing and they weren't going to do all the cooking and they weren't going to just do that. And people booed them. My fellows booed them. And, but that was the beginning of a change. They didn't move much longer after that because women built a movement of their own inside and outside and said, we demand our rights. This is mythology. We are equal and we have to have an equal society where women have as much power as men. That exploded. The environmental movement began at that time and created a conscience about the earth that we live in. The Native American movement began at that time, AIM, the American Indian movement. We're sitting right now on the anniversary of 1973 of when AIM took over the Wounded Knee, which was a place in Dakotas, in South Dakota, where in 1890s there was a massacre of Indians in their ghost dance, and it became a very symbolic place for many Native people. They took that town over. And many of them were Vietnam vets. To say that, because a lot of Vietnam vets came back from the war and joined the anti-war movement because they realized what they did in Nam was just wrong. They felt sick about what happened in Nam. Proud of serving the country, but so sick about what happened. They had a thing called Winter Soldier, where they actually testified about all they saw. And so America got torn apart, torn asunder. And we're still seeing the results of that day, today, and we've yet to figure out how to redefine ourselves as a people. Which is why, partially why, partially, there's many other reasons why, the media has splintered into all these little various places. And part of the reason you're so important is that you will be the ones that will define what happens in the century. Do we find a way to come back as a new nation? People used to say, integration is great, but then black folks started asking, integrate into what? Integrate into just being white? To that world? I don't think so. We've got to integrate into a new world that has to be built. And so the media reflects that dissension we're having now among ourselves, trying to figure out who we are. And part of what you're doing, like when you go to your neighborhoods working in these deindustrialized neighborhoods like in Curtis Bay and, and Sparrows Point and, and, and other communities, that's what you're doing. Because you're looking at communities that were once the heart and soul of, the in, of industry. And because we've watched the system we live in, which is capitalism, have all the constraints taken off of it, people have lost their way of living. They've lost the ability to make a living. And you're telling that story. And that's a critical story for you to figure out what comes next and to help communities figure out what comes next in the synergy between you all. Because the story you tell about that will be the story that heals America and begins the change. So the projects you're doing now are not just a college exercise. I think the, the kind of stuff that you're doing with your teachers now in these communities is something that could have a profound effect on the communities and will have a profound effect on you. I mean, what I've discovered is a lot of things that I did back when I was 18, 20 years old are still, they come back to me now at this age. I'll be 68 in May, and they still push me. And I realize how much they molded me, and I'm glad they did. I mean, you get older and you think a little bit differently about stuff, but still, they're the things that push you. And these things you're doing at this moment are going to push you because they're going to be so profound. They're going to change you profoundly as you kind of mold them over. So. They wanted me to talk a little bit about how this connects to the work I do. So we have a company called the Center for Emerging Media. And the Center for Emerging Media is a company I started 14 years ago um, to try to do some projects that would meld different medias, but also create stories about social justice and create stories about people's lives you don't hear. And so we did things like a project called Just Words. Just Words was a piece that we did that told the stories of the working poor. And I, next time we get together, I'll play some of these for you. Um, if you have time, I actually can play. I have my computer, actually. I can play some. But um, th these were stories of the working poor in their own voices. And this one, that won us the Peabody because it just, they were very poignant 
all you heard was, this is the important thing about media, and when you do these stories, you didn't hear my voice. I introed it. This, welcome to Just Words. You're about to hear whoever that person is. And then we close with, thank you for listening, whatever we said. But the voice you heard in the whole thing was the voice of the person who was telling their story. So that you really don't interfere in their telling their story. And that's important. And I think also it's important because nobody hears these stories. You know, I was thinking about something we did, we're doing now. Um, we had a program the other week where somebody called in. And he told the story of what happened when he was let out of Jessup Prison at 4 o'clock in the morning and given 50 bucks and had to catch a cab that cost $40 to get back to Baltimore. I had $10 left and didn't know where he was going to go. So I, we got his number. I've talked to him since. And we're re resurrecting this, just, we're calling it Just Words 2.0. But I mean, to hear those voices, to hear the voice of people that we don't hear, because the dislocated in our society are growing in number, not lessing in number. And the show we're doing right now on a series of housing issues, I mean, they're, they're one of the things we discovered that doing this series of shows is that we have 192,000 approximately families in the city of Baltimore, 192,000 families. 89,000 of, 89, of those families are home insecure. Don't know from one month to the next if they're going to have a home to live in. Those are stories you don't hear. Those are stories that we're obligated to tell. Those are the voices we're obligated to put on the internet and obligated to put on the radio for people to hear and see who these people are and what they have to tell us. So that to me, if, if, if you don't do that, you know, it's like when I, I talked about Edward R. Murrow back in the 50s, and he's the one who gave us this lesson, really. Uh, if you haven't seen this, you can look it up and read about it. Harvest of Shame, it's called. Um, it was a documentary he did for early 1950s television. And it was about the migrant workers. And he put that out there to tell their story. And they began to change some of the laws and the consciousness of America. And that's what we do. Our job is to expose what goes on. Not just to tell stories of accidents and who shot who on the corner of whatever and whatever. And you know, the, the other gobbledygook they put on you. I, I don't even watch the evening news anymore. It's just so, I don't, I can't watch it. It doesn't tell me anything. So I stop watching. I literally don't watch it. Um, it's our job to tell those stories because we have to expose what's right and what's wrong. We have to expose the stories of people who are joyous in their work and why. We have to expose the stories of what's wrong with the system and the people who are, whose voices are not heard. That's what we need to do. And, and that, in some ways, is what you're doing with this project. And one of the things I think about with this project you're doing is you're out there interviewing people, talking to them, meeting them. And listening is very critical. Hearing their stories. Shutting yourself. You know, when you're an actor, when, you, when you're an actor, one of the things about being an actor is that you Focus in on a moment. You're in a moment. You're in a place at that time, in a moment. And everything else around you is suspended. You know, you don't let anything come in your head. Because you you're that character. You're somebody else. But when you're doing this kind of work you're doing, you also have to be like an actor. Because you have to be in that moment and just focus on what that person is saying and what that story is around you and not on all the other extraneous crap around you but just on that, because that's listening. I tell this story a lot. Um, Valerie's heard this story before, so my wife, and she's here, and she hears the story plenty, because she can leave the room, because she'll probably tell the story herself. But when I started the radio show in 1993, the Johns Hopkins Center for American Indian Health asked me to go to their um, board of directors meeting, which was taking place on the Ojibwe Reservation in Wisconsin. So I went. A great experience. But there was this woman doing a documentary there, just a little small one. She sat on the sink, and everybody, when they came in, sat on the commode, and she asked a question about what is communication. And people gave really interesting answers about what communication is. And when she showed the film, what was interesting is that almost every white and black person in the room had a fairly 
if not lengthy, a, a complex idea of what communication meant and what it is. Almost every Indian person in that video, native person in the video, said one word. One word. Listening. 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 That became, you know, you know, you know all through our lives, whether we're 18 years old or whether we're 68 years old or whatever, whatever age we are, we all have these epiphanal moments, right? The things that they click and go, oh, that's it. Well, that was one of those for me. Because that said to me, I was always, you know, somebody who would be very combative when you said something to me. I knew, I knew what I was right. I, you, you don't agree with me? What? What? Don't tell me. I know what the answer is, and I would be in your face. And, but then the listening part came in. I started thinking about listening. And I started treating my show. It had only been like a month into my show when this happened. I started completely changing how I think about what we do. And this is part of the work you do when you work in these communities, is just to turn it off and hear what people have to say. And let that flow. And one of the things that taught me is that the truth lives in every corner. Whether you are a conservative, even if you're a racist, you have something to learn from racists. You have something to learn from people you'd even think you'd ever want to look or talk to again. Everybody has something to teach us if you hear them. And so that's the one skill I think is very critical. And when you interview people, and this is hard to do when you're first starting out, because I know you guys are interviewing folks as well in your communities, is uh, you, you always prepare. I mean, I prepare like a madman before a show. I always have, always will. Not quite as crazy as I used to because I know what I'm doing after 20 some years, but, but I, but I always prepare. I think about what I want to know, what kind of questions I might want to ask. But when it starts, I take the paper. I never, I put it over here. It's in my head. I ask a question. But then it's like improv jazz. You go with the flow. Someone talks to you and gives you an answer. You hit that key, you play with that key. Someone else says another key, you play with that key. But you always have the composition in the back of your head so you know how to connect the keys to bring it to where you wanted to go. But you let it be like improv. You just don't worry about all the questions you have on the paper. It will flow and it will all come out eventually. It just usually does. Yeah, well, like today I, one, I mean, I, but you always miss something. I missed something today. I interviewed Paul Graziano, who's a housing commissioner, I was really, and, and I was really preparing for it because I knew he's like a bully a little bit, you know, likes to overpower things and run things. So I know I had to be sharp and tough and not let him do that and get the questions I want out. Not let him slide away and get what he wanted to say about me pushing what I wanted to push. So I, I forgot one question today, which that was a mistake. That bugged me. I've been bugged by the one question I didn't get to all day. Um, but that happens too. But for the most part, you get what you want to get done. But it's listening, preparing, listening, and allowing your subjects to take you where they want to take you. And eventually they're going to say something also to help you get back to your own composition. And it weaves itself together. I mean, that's, that, that's really what it is. And are you, are, you, are you taping these things, audio or video? Or both, right? Yeah. Both, right? Because that's the magic of it. Because later, the editing process is where you can control what comes out. It doesn't mean you, you should be dishonest with what comes out. I mean, you don't take away from the honesty of the voices of the people, because then they won't trust you anymore. And they shouldn't. When people trust you, when people trust you with their stories, it's, to me, akin to trusting somebody with your love. If you tell somebody you love them, then you better be straight about it. If you're going to tell somebody that you, their story is going to be, you're going to listen to their story, you're going to let them tell their story, and you better be honest about it. Not use people for your own ends, which we all have a tendency to do. I mean, we're human beings. You just got to control it. And so you have to let, their, you have to let them be honest, but you can then, in the editing process, is where you can really begin to mold the story and let it come out in the way you see it, because you are the creators, and you're going to create what the story, but you, within that you have to remain honest to the people that you're talking to. Um, the problem is, 
that so many journalists and so many people drop into neighborhoods and then drop out again and leave nothing behind and leave nothing, no connection. And that's part of the problem. We can't do that. I mean, um, I can't do that. I mean, I, you know, I, you, 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 if you make a commitment to somebody, you have to keep it. Their lives are on the line, and you're telling these stories. And you're trying to figure out what is going on and what comes next. And a big part of what you're going to be doing is what comes next. So, and this is how you build relationships and communities. So the students who come after you, you leave a reputation of trust that lives on after you. Well, I can trust these kids from UMBC because they they did a solid by me. They, they, they told the truth. They didn't lie to me. And you're building on that for the next group of students to come after you to do the same thing. You're, you're leaving your reputation, and it feeds on the others coming behind you. And what, what Jason was saying earlier is true. I mean, I think that you to trust your intelligence, because that's what happens with adults a lot, is they don't trust your intelligence. And, you know, when we were in the civil rights movement as teenagers in our early 20s, and when we were organizing, whether it was Poor People's Campaign, Resurrection City, and going through Appalachia, organizing communities, or, or, or in the Cambridge, Maryland, the civil rights work, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22 years old, we were right. We were young and we were right. We were young and we were right. A lot of old people trying to tell us we were wrong. Slow down. Don't push it. Let it take its time. Don't sit in. Don't push the issue. Bullshit. We were right. And you got to know you're right. You have to know you're right. You're young and you're right. Anybody tells you a young person to slow down and just take it gradually? We well, might as well be old then. Right? <laughs> and you're not. You're the energy that pushes it forward. And you've got to use that and feel it and believe in it. Don't let somebody tell you you're wrong. I mean, when I say that, think about it. I mean, you, if you can take in what other people are saying and listen to the wisdom of people who are older, they can help you figure out what you're doing as well. I mean, I had a teacher in high school. Her name was Berta Rance. Berta was uh, 86 years old when she taught me. Um, she was an amazing woman. She, <laughs> when she was 112 or 13, whatever it is, just before she died, I talked to her. And I said, Berta, how are you feeling? She said, my mind is sharp as ever, but my body's a blob. I can't move. But she taught me so much. She's a woman who, whose father came here with Karl Marx, to help start the first international revolutionary group. She rode the trains as a young woman with Eugene V. Debs, the socialist candidate in the 1890s and early 1900s. She hung out with Gertrude Stein and Ernest Hemingway in Paris. She had all this stuff, and she was our literature teacher. She had so much wisdom. She was such an incredible woman. And she would have these afternoon teas, and we would go to her afternoon teas and talk, whatever she wanted to talk about, whether it was Shakespeare or Hemingway or or uh, Langston Hughes, whatever it was she went to, because she knew all those folks in the Harlem Renaissance as well. And so what I'm saying that to say is that just because you need to push because you're young, you also got to listen that what we, what, that's the wisdom that also came before you. What we do in this culture, we're so divided in this culture that we don't hear the wisdom from other places. You know? I mean, we're in a place where old people are here, and middle-aged people are here, and young people are here, and black folks are here, and white folks are here, and Chinese people are here, and Indians are over here, and Hindus are over here, and they may be coming to class together, but we don't really come together. And especially around age, we don't understand and respect what ages can give us. And I, and I think that's something we have to think about, how you're going to reinvent this 21st century and what that's going to mean. And that, I think, is very critical. Um, I do think it's critical. So, trust your intelligence and don't let folks tell you that you don't know what you're saying, because you do know what you're saying. You're smart, you wouldn't be here, right? You'd be somewhere else, but you're here. So, 
one of the other things that that the Colin others wanted me to talk about was like where where we where I think Baltimore's coming from come from and where it's going. I, mean, I grew up in a Baltimore that's very different than the Baltimore area that you. How many of you from around here? Okay, so where are you? Where are you from? New York? Los Angeles. Huh? So from all over. Okay, cool. So this could be any city in America. This story is just about. Every city has its unique qualities. But Baltimore was a city that's always a very strange place. <laughs> you know, always, people love. They always elected quirky, weird people to office in this town. Always, even when I was a kid. Um, but Baltimore was a place. Baltimore was a place. This is emblematic of what I'm about to talk about. Baltimore was probably the only city in the United States of America where the mafia didn't get into. The only cities in the whole country the mafia didn't get into. On the block I lived on growing up, there was a guy down the street. His name was Hitty Waldstein. And Hitty Waldstein was a bookie, and he was arrested once because he drove the car in a drive-by on the block. So don't make people think that drive-bys only happened in a black neighborhood in 2013. This shit happened everywhere all the time. <laughs> Hitty Waldstein drove the car. They took out some people on the block. And Hitty was married to Benny Trotter's daughter. Benny Trotter ran the Italian mob, and, and Hitty came out of the Jewish mob, and there was a black mob that Little Willie and other guys ran, and there was a, and, and there was a, there was a Greek mob, and there was this Appalachian white boys mob from Hamden, and there were every, every town, every part of the city had its own mob. The, Italian, <laughs> the mafia came in, and these mobs came together and wouldn't let them in. They ran the city themselves. And they got along. They didn't go after each other. Everybody had a little bit of territory. And they helped create the city. A lot of the institutions in this town were created by those guys. Um, by that I mean there was a guy named Little Willie, who was a brilliant guy. He, was a book, he ran the bookmaking business in the black, Little Willie Adams, lovely human being, really was a lovely man, who ran the bookmaking operations in the black neighborhood. He is the one who bankrolled Park Sausages. That's how it started, because the white banks wouldn't give money to people. He gave the money to the people to start businesses. That's where black people got their money from, from people like Willie to be able to start businesses in their community. He started helped us start Ideal Savings and Loan. When black people couldn't go to the beach, he, started, he bought a plot of land on the Chesapeake Bay. It became Cars Beach, which is where, in my days of growing up, where black folks went to swim because couldn't go to Ocean City. Um, and also had the greatest shows around. Everybody came there to sing. Um, so Baltimore has always been this separate town. But it was a town that had this huge industrial base so that everyone had a job. The places you're working in now, you know, you see a lot of places where you're working now that there are families where they're split up and people say men on around and the rest, but the difference was that when I drive through the city of Baltimore and I see these empty abandoned houses, when I was a kid, all those houses were filled with people. Mothers and fathers and children hanging out. Black, white, Italian, whoever. Everybody's just hanging out. I mean, they had the places, they were there. Fathers were all over the place. Everybody had stores. It was alive. And so now we have this place that is very different. And I think that, you know, we did a show today and talked about where the future may be going and what's happened with the dislocation, the stuff you're looking at with deindustrialization, the, the idea of why things are getting abandoned and, and what's happening in those communities. You're at the cusp of a story that you have to think about as you're doing this story because, as, as I'll tell you what like, the show we're doing now, the series on housing, because the federal government has taken all this money away from federal housing. It's been going on since 1980 and Ronald Reagan. So it's gutting the money for public housing. So you've got Paul Graziano saying we're going to privatize public housing because they don't have any money. And he's trying to figure out what to do. And I don't agree with what they're doing, but I don't think he has much of an alternative, to tell you the truth. I mean, he does. He does. And I talked to him about that today. And this is what I'm talking about when I say you've got to think about where the future is going. So what's the alternative? You've got to say like Baltimore, with all these um, empty lots and abandoned houses, and the only way we can think about doing it is to sell them off to private developers for people who have money, with lots of money. 
There's other ways. The creative ways of designing the city. Think about bonds. I've been pushing, that's where we're starting to push the government now here is on the question of bonds. Float municipal bonds. You know, you, municipal bonds are these mini bonds are things where you get private investors, they do this all over the world, and people vote on a municipal bond. That's how they put money in museums. That's how they put money in park and recs. That's how they put money in rehabbing the city. That's where Walter's Art Gallery gets its money, museum. But that's from bonds, right? So if the city's thinking creatively, why not have, think about floating bonds to fix up our houses, to fix up communities, to give them control and power over those communities, start community land trusts so those places belong to the people and can't be sold off as private investment. We're the only developed country in the world that doesn't have public housing. We're the only place in the world, developed countries, that doesn't have public housing for everybody. You go to Austria, France, Germany, there's public housing. People have homes. There was no homelessness before 1980. Yeah, there were guys who didn't want to live at home. and People called them hobos. Yes, they all existed. I knew them. They hung out at the docks. They were always around. But there was no homelessness in America, homelessness in America. The scale we have now before 1980 did not exist. There weren't beggars on the There were never beggars on the corner when I was a kid. Nobody was panhandling for money when I was a kid. Never happened. Didn't happen in 1970 when I was organizing in poor neighborhoods. Didn't happen. Wasn't going on. Because the federal government invested in public housing and everybody had a home to live in. Might not be the grandest place in the world, but everybody had a home to live in. Those neighborhoods you're working in, everyone had a home to live in. They took away the money, we got homelessness. That's where it comes from. It's not from people being lazy, the vast majority of people are homeless and adult. Take that back. The majority of people who are homeless and adult work. Or work at odd jobs or doing whatever they can. Some don't. Some are alcoholics. Some are junkies. All that's true, too. But the alcoholics and junkies should have homes, too. <laughs> right? I mean, I think everyone should have a home. Um, so we have to ask the questions of what sh can we be doing instead? and not accepting the answers we're given. Doesn't always make you popular with folks who have these questions they have to answer, but it's the questions we have to force them to answer. And so where's Baltimore going to go, the next, this whole area? Where's the country going to go? I mean, you're the ones going to help define that. You really are. I mean, you will be the people to define the 21st century culture. You're the people who are going to define what our society looks like and have to think critically about the, where we are when you're in those places, like Curtis Bay and, and, and um, Sparrow's point, to envision what, that, what the questions are that you need to ask about where we're going to go to next in the 21st century. What can happen to these communities? What's going to happen to their kids? What's going to happen to the people of your generation in those neighborhoods? And you, those are the kind of questions you have to formulate as you're thinking about how you're telling the stories you're telling. So it's not just a static thing about, about this is what we see here. It's what could be. And you'll hear that from the voices of the people you talk to. You, uh, who, uh, who, who here is working in the Curtis Bay area? You all work in Curtis Bay? So, I mean, in that neighborhood, you've got these young people who are standing up against the incinerator, right? Um, they need you and you need them. Now, they may lose this battle because the powers to be have already decided that's where all the trash in Baltimore is going, and that needs to be exposed, and we're doing our best to expose that. My job. But you're helping give them a voice, and they're giving you a voice, and this is where it works together. You guys are working in tandem with them. People think that if journalists have to be like objective and apart, I never believe that for a minute. I've never been like, I can't do that. I mean, when you're in a place, you're in it, and you've got to feel what the people are feeling if you're going to help them get through it and also tell the story for everybody else to know. And in their lives, where the future could be. So you lose, we always lose battles. We're always going to lose battles, but it's a continuum of struggle to make a better society. That's how we move ahead. You know, I mean, I'll, I'll close. I don't want to hear what you got to say, so, I mean, that, but that's how we move ahead. We started in an America where 
I don't know the exact number, but I'm going to say 1% of the majority of white Americans cared a twit about what happened to slaves and black people in this country when it started. Now you have an election. Barack Obama won. I'm not saying that's the panacea, because it certainly is not the panacea. Racism didn't end and change overnight because Barack Obama became president. And it won't. It's an ongoing struggle. But what did happen was that 43% of white Americans voted for a black man for president of the United States of America. That's for people like me who faced down mobs coming after us and had people or friends killed in the civil rights movement, people we knew died to see that. There's a shift, and you all are going to define that shift. It's not going to be easy because there's still a lot of mistrust, there's still a lot of racism, there's still a lot of poverty, all kinds of other things going on, figuring out where the money is going to come from to make this country work, but you are going to define that shift. You're going to define that shift together. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. And so do not disconnect yourself from the work you do. You want to stay connected and inside of it so that, so that you feel what they feel and they feel your honesty and you can get the work done. Because um, I guess clued with this, because what you do is you're crossing boundaries. You are, cross, you are crossing boundaries. Um, this boundary, you know, and it's not too dissimilar from what we did. It's different because it's a different era, but we were high school, college students who were crossing into boundaries in really poor neighborhoods to organize and work. You're crossing boundaries, too, in your work. And that's how it happens. That's where this unity happens. Um, let me stop here for a moment and see what you all want to ask me or just want to throw out some ideas. And if I go, what? It's because I haven't got my hearing aids yet and I need them. But I'll have to say it again. <laughs> I am a little deaf. I don't know why I am. Why am I deaf? Just that deaf. Please go ahead. I have two um, questions. One has to do with um, the corporate structure that we're in um, because they control a lot of the media nowadays. How do you pass that in your work um, so that you can have your own voice and to expose some of the things that are going on? Don't, you're all young, you're not deaf, I am, I'm sorry. Um, um, that's a good question. I mean, well, I was pushed out of one place already that I helped start because some people didn't like the questions I was asking and also didn't like the way I thought about how a station should be managed in a more democratic way. So it's not easy. I mean, the reality about journalism is that Young people going into journalism now are f having to find their own independent voice. It might, necessarily need, might not necessarily need the money. Or not as much, there's no, there's no path into like going into like to some papers of becoming a foreign correspondent and building a 30 year career. Right now that's dead. <clears throat> that's not happening. And we saw the corporate structure just take over um, the city paper. Now, people are trying to be optimistic about it. The city paper does great investigative work. They cover the culture in this city of Baltimore in ways other people don't. They get underneath of it a little bit, you know. But my jaundiced way of looking at things sometimes, I give it 18 to 36 months before they turn it into, flip it into just something, whatever. So it's always going to be a problem. We are facing that. I mean, the, the battle between the people of America and the corporate world is very real. It doesn't have to be that way. I mean, the corporate world needs limits. We all need limits. You know, when you're raised as a child, your parents gave you limits, right? Some parents gave you a little bit more room than others, but parents give you limits. And they give you limits because we'll go nuts if we don't have limits of some kind put on us somewhere, and we, then we start putting them on ourselves. Corporations need limits, or they will rip us off, which is what they're doing. And so we had a nation where we started putting limits on corporations and, you know, we had the segregation and middle class was growing and stuff was happening and those limits were taken away and poverty is growing and they have endless power and that's part of what we're facing, which is why the incinerator is going to get built. I don't want to be pessimistic, I'm just trying to be realistic. 
which is why Cove Point will probably happen because the United States is becoming the Saudi Arabia of gas and they'll frack us to death and take all that gas out and not think about how to build an alternative energy future. But that's the battle we have. So it doesn't mean everybody has to sacrifice your entire life and stand up to it. I mean, but you've got to be aware of that and the way you live your life and what you fight for and what you believe in because it's very, it can be very tough. I mean, you know, I, if, if I lost what I have now, media-wise, where I am, um, we have our own company, but it'll be very tough how to build the next piece. I and mean, we're moving into real news. The Real News Network is an online news firm that moved to Baltimore, bought this building on the corner of Saratoga and Holiday. And we're moving our studios in there because they built TV radio studios and they're going to be really nice and we have a good space to work out of. And we'll see where that takes us. But you, it's always uncertain. You know, you just don't know. Um, but I don't think that's a reason not to kind of push it ahead. One of my professors said to me that um, people have more power than they think they do. Yes, right. So does that mean that we go back to the 60s era with some of the um, things that we did in the 60s to bring about change? Or do you see another dynamic that we can use to bring about uh, um, this uh, structure with the corporations to relieve some of their hold on the American public? Well, the citizens of Walmart. Right, right, right. I, I, I don't know what the dynamic will be for you all. I mean, you'll make your dynamic. I can't make your dynamic for you. Each era has its own. Well, you know, it, it's, it's next what? Well, some people did something. And some people didn't. You know, I mean, there's a mythology about this a little bit. In the 60s, even in, in all right. When we worked in the civil rights movement in Baltimore City and in Cambridge, Maryland, there were not there were huge swaths of the black world that didn't want this to happen. Don't sit in, don't push the man, he'll push back, it's not safe, don't do it. And the younger generation said, we're doing it. We're not waiting anymore. We're ending this thing. So, you know, it was never like everybody and it never will be like everybody. Um, it just doesn't work that way. And I think that you're going to have to define what those forms are. I mean, you see happening stuff around the country. The, the world is a confusing place. I mean, you know, you, you look at like Ukraine. Think about America, look at like Ukraine. It's a very confusing place. It, 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 the news gives, here's the thing about doing the stuff we do in the news. The news gives you this, and most of the news in America gives you this one line. Putin's crazy. All the Ukrainian dissidents are good. America's right. That's crazy. It's not happening that way. It's confusing. Putin wants to stay in control. It's been a, if, if you look at Russian history for the last 500 years, you'll understand what's going on in the Ukraine a little bit better. There's a great quote from George Orwell. I use it all the time. He uses he. I don't see, use he. They who control the past control the future. They who control the present control the past. So we in our own ways alternatively have to control that ourselves. We have to understand what happened before to understand what's going on right now. You know? So it's complex over there. And we, and th that's one of the things you have to understand in the work you're doing in those communities is understand the complexity. Nothing is simple. Well, some things are simple, but you know what I'm saying. Inside that world, people's worlds, it's not simple. Piggybacking off of the last question, um, the relationship between unfettered capitalism and equity, uh, what are some tactics that you've used uh, in the past to help people to integrate and not be marginalized by the system? Mm. Well, it all kind of, well I, I, what popped in my head were two things. One was Tug, attending union group. I was an organizer in South Baltimore, and this was in the early 70s, and um, it was South Baltimore, it wasn't Federal Hill then. Federal Hill, when I was a kid, was just the park on the hill. The neighborhood was called South Baltimore, and it had two parts. Well, there's a white part of South Baltimore across Charles Street with Sharp Lenton Hall, which was the black neighborhood. And we were organizers there in the early 70s. 
and put out a newspaper called the South Baltimore Voice, which is a great newspaper. Went on for seven years. And it had a real effect on organizing that community because people we read, wrote stories about the people in that community and they helped write those stories. And we organized a tenants union group. And that was the first interracial group of t a tenants union ever before in the history of Baltimore. Black and white, poor folks, poor working people got together to fight landlords. And we did everything from collecting rats and roaches and stuff from the landlord's homes and dropping them on their doorstep in Towson, Pikesville, Roland Park, wherever they lived, and just left them a cage. So when they opened the door in the morning, they saw rats in a cage. Little signs of this comes from your house that you own. People get evicted. We put the people's stuff back in the house and change the locks. The victim again, we do it again and worked with lawyers to change the law. The laws that, that reformed the housing court then, which allowed for representation of, of people in tenants court, are laws that we did with these lawyers who then worked for legal aid, that rewrote the law, got it passed, and changed, and it, it still has a long way to go, but we changed the series of bodies laws. That's the kinds of things that change things, is, you, is pushing, and being unafraid to push. Um, so, and building a coalition, one of the things I learned is that, in doing that work, is that um, we could organize a cross-racial union, despite the racism of some of the white people in the community, and the mistrust that black folks have towards the white people across the road. Because they had a common bind, a common role, a common goal, which is a fight for their rights in their housing. So you can, I mean, it takes things like that to do, you know, whether it's Curtis Bay, Sparrow's Point, or wherever you are. So, I, you know, it just, take, it, takes, it just takes some heart. I, I, right now I'm telling you, like, some of the kids who are young people doing Occupy, who are around your age, a little older, I was saying, you know, if, if you want, and I was still in dialogue about the stuff they're doing now, is that if you want to occupy something, occupy some vacant buildings. <coughs> occupy vacant, build, vacant buildings. Every neighborhood has electricians, carpenters, plumbers. People will know what they're doing. Occupy the buildings. Rehab them yourself. And dare them to push you out. We're rehabbing this house. We're taking it over. I don't care who owns it. We own it. Now move us out. No, because we're living here. This is our home now. People have to do things like that. Have to think about ways of doing things that confront the system, but in a way that is more beautiful than violent, you know, because you're not going to beat them head up. I mean, this is too they got too much power. You got to beat them in other ways to get things done because they just, they do just, you know, it's like me being five foot eight trying to fight a guy who's six foot eight. I'm not going to have him. I'm going I'm to lose. Um, so you, you know, you, you, uh, you have to think creatively. I think that's part of the beauty of your generation is you do think like that. You think of ways of doing things that are in, in a, in a less, less confrontational way, at least I think, from what I've learned from the people. I've, you know, people tell me that <coughs> your generation is not involved, they don't care. I find just the opposite. I think you're a very exciting generation. I think what you're doing is exciting. I think you have great energy. And um, I, you know, I'm, I'm enamored of some of the stuff I see going on from y'all. So I mean, you have to think of anything about else? Teachers? I was just thinking about the social media piece. I was thinking of both of your questions or comments were um, interesting in that you could employ social media in ways that you, like Kickstarters, for instance, doing things that are more micro-based or yeah. smaller-based. Um, I think you, you have a lot of power using Facebook besides just being connected to friends. Um, using the social media systems that have been designed for one purpose to occupy those systems and employ, the, employ them in, in, in creative and innovative ways. I'm also thinking of uh, Europe is a great model of squatters uh, taking over uh, unused uh, lost land or lost buildings and coming in and using their own sweat and equity to improve the neighborhood. I, was, I had a real rare uh, experience I had a friend who lived in the Bronx, New York, which is where I lived before coming to 
uh, Baltimore, just outside of the Bronx, and he gave me a tour of the Bronx that uh, was uh, really unique, and I learned about the Hells Angels, who were connected with a group called the Chinks. So it was the Hells Angels, uh, the, a Chinese Hells Angels, and an African American Hells Angels, and they were lived in this building, which they squatted in, I think starting in the 50s, and they, they basically policed the neighborhood. They were taking kids off the streets and uh, clothing them, making them go to school and uh, read their history. And I, I was like blown away by this group who I had a, an image or a, or a concept of them that considered them destructive, but actually in this context, they were very creative. And, and the police had a great deal of respect for this Bronx group who were basically take, took over their own neighborhood and controlled their own neighborhood. I think it has to begin in your own home, and then you find neighbors who are compatible and yeah. build it from grassroots. And, and that's like, you know, like the Panthers did that in the 1960s. It's yes. exactly what they did. People think, you know, that that's what they did. Um, there was, uh, and there was, and, and it was really there was this Rainbow Coalition that happened in in that period. I mean, there was a group called the Young Patriots, which were Appalachian whites that I used to work very closely with some of whom were former Klansmen uh, on the upper, upper north side of Chicago. They were like the white, black, the white Appalachian Black Panthers. It was the Young Lords, the Brown Berets were the Mexicans, the Young Lords were Puerto Ricans. Uh, you had, and, and every group had, and they worked together. I mean, they came together to make these changes, and they did just that. Mm -hmm. Protected the neighborhood, fed people, convinced drug dealers not to deal, not to deal on the corner. I mean, those things can happen again, and they are happening. I, I'm gonna go meet these people in the Bronx. <laughs> That'd be a good story. People need to hear that story. Yeah, yeah good. Um, just in response to this notion of social media, I'd be really interested to uh, investigate if there are any social campaigns that are utilizing big data or social media to achieve their ends. We hear about corporations, schools, um, governments are certainly uh, actively looking for ways to make all of this new information work for them. Uh, but I really haven't you know, heard of any social movement trying to utilize data and utilize uh, either you know, big data or just the social media platforms to achieve some objective. Yeah, there are a lot. Yeah, there are a lot. I mean, there are groups that are doing the big data stuff, like the Institute for Policy Studies and others in Washington, DC, which is a think tank. And they do some really good work, and they're connected to things like, say, like them around the country, and 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 people are utilizing that data in movements across. I'm, I not not one is popping in my head at the moment, but I'm thinking about there's a magazine. I don't know if you've ever seen it called Yes Magazine. Anybody ever seen that magazine? Yes. <clears throat> what well, Yes is well, there's magazines that connects those kind of peoples and those dots like that, and they are happening. I mean, I'd be glad. I have to. I can come up with a whole list of them. They're not in my brain at this moment but I could come up with a whole list of groups that are actually doing that around the country. Um, and that's what is it, that, that's the tool you have. I mean, you have a way of exploding things across the media that we didn't, um, you know, because you can in, instantaneously connect people and ideas and creatively get them these facts and figures and make them in a way that people want to, can really understand them. Um, but there are those groups. They are happening all over. There's, there's a new media group that has, they have these conferences every year um, that bring young people, like the younger people together <coughs> who are doing just that kind of work. Um, and what I'll do is I'll make sure I get a list of these, they're easy to get, and I'll make sure you get that list, that everybody gets that list, because they're there. And I think exist. that group, like anonymous, you know, using social media right. to kind of take up for people who are kind of ignored. But I would caution all the young people in the room not to over determine the power of social media because you still have to be on the ground fighting. <coughs> and in a city like Baltimore, there's 20 to 40 percent of the population, and often in the not, you know, not the the downtown or you know the nice neighborhoods. But there's still 20 to 40 percent of people who don't have access to you know Technology, social media right. and right. we always have to think about free radio public radio where all you have to do is kind of turn something on 
uh, publication that's like actually printed mm -hmm. um, that you can pass around. So it's it's part of the process, and it's a wonderful new part of the process. But you can't throw away. You know, you have to add that to your toolkit mm -hmm. rather than allow that to replace these things. Because you can I like something and say you're coming to something all day, but you got to show up. You got to be there. You got to put your feet to the ground. You got to get your right. hands dirty, which is really what we try and push students to do in our class. And social media is great for getting those things going, but it's only one part of the toolkit. Mm -hmm. It, it does take on the ground work. I mean, <clears throat> if you're running a campaign, they say politically, you know, people think you can just run it completely by social media. You can't. I mean, that's one of the reasons one of the mayoral candidates everybody liked so much in the beginning lost because he put all of his money into just social media and didn't put any into knocking on doors, saying, hi, I'm this, and listen, this is what my beliefs are, and I'm going to come sit in your backyard and get your neighbors and have a barbecue and talk. And I mean, that's what it takes. You have to combine the two. You know, um, you have to combine the two. I mean, um, there's stuff going on all over America, but the major media doesn't cover it. It's happening everywhere. You've heard of Moral Mondays? You ever heard of See, that's what I'm saying. It's not your fault because nobody knows this stuff because the media is not covering it. Mor Moral Mondays, North Carolina. Last weekend, 85,000 black and white Native American. Asian North Carolinians got together to say the conservative government that's in power in North Carolina doesn't represent us. We want a right to Medicaid. We want a right to housing. 85,000 people in the capital of North Carolina. The establishment media does not cover that. It's happening now in Atlanta, South Carolina. It's spreading across the South. You know, the people don't talk about the Dream Defenders had taken place in Florida. They have not stopped working in Florida. They came out after Trayvon Martin's case. They're still there. I mean, and that to me gave me hope. Not Trayvon's death, obviously, but the idea that I have a 17-year-old daughter who lives in Georgia, and she's emblematic of so many young people I've been talking to and listening to across the country of a cross-racial um, universal anger over what happened to Trayvon Martin. And what the media wants to always play it up as is just a black thing. Black people are upset because Trayvon was killed. No. In your generation, it crosses. People are upset about what happened. And I think that that's, and the connections aren't being made because it's not, the establishment media doesn't cover that anymore. I mean, they don't make those connections. During the 1968, one of the things that helped end the Vietnam War were those connections were made. With, actually, when Walter Cronkite and those guys showed the pictures of the demonstrations, showed the pictures of Vietnamese being killed, civilians, showed the picture of what happened to our boys, in, uh, our brothers in Nam when they were fought there, that helped change the tide of the country because that was the connections being made. People, so they're not making those connections. We have to make those connections because they're out there. People across the country are doing stuff all over America, all over America. We had a segment on our show that <coughs> stopped. We have to res we want to resurrect it. It was called Rise Up, Stand Up. Is that, is that what we called it? Yeah, from Bob Marley's song. And we were, we were telling stories from people all across America and beginning to connect them on in, in the show with activists here in Baltimore. So they'd know each other and get to know each other. People started connecting. People in Baltimore don't know each other. We had a show just a couple weeks ago between black and white activists in Baltimore um, talking about some issues. Nobody in the room had ever met each other. Didn't know each other. White young people from the east side of Baltimore, black young people from the west side of Baltimore, different parts, feeling the same way about where our city should be. That kind of divide around race was there, but then it began to change because they met each other on the air. They never met each other before. That's what these media can do, pull people together and don't know each other. There's a lot of energy out there. They like to keep it all out here so it doesn't come together like this, you know? Yeah. Professors?
realist or more perhaps social realist? How I balance them? Or negotiate over Well, time. you know, it's recently I've been figuring out how to put them all together and what comes next for the next stage of the work that we do because um, they've always been very different. I mean, the theater work, our documentary work and the theater work have been very separate in my, in my life. I, they're really, I, guess I really never have combined them. And I've been thinking a lot about that lately. Because uh, 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 <clears throat> the theater work we did was, um, what I did was uh, the mostly poor communities, young people, and in prisons. And um, it had a social purpose in that it was out there to make people think about what was going on around them and using that way. And <laughs> that our doc work has been just straight doc work. We, never, we didn't really marry them. But I've been thinking about it because we've been thinking a lot about history and how history fits into this and how you can, there's ideas I'm playing with, but I'm not finished playing with them yet in my head. <laughs> well, what comes next? I guess you want to end soon, don't you? I mean, you know, I'm, I'm fine, but I just. Well, just one last question. Um, from reading a little bit of your bio, um, I saw, I read the movie that they showed today, yesterday at home, and I was thinking that you've been very instrumental in bringing a lot of prominent people uh, to the forefront. Have you met anybody recently um, in your work that you think matched some of the other people who have become celebrities or um, famous that might be the next Nile Max or whoever well, in your work? <laughs> I mean, hmm. I mean, it's been my experience, you know, people always say that leaders don't, are, are, are created by the movements and they're not the really ones that did it. And other people say, no, it's a great person who creates the movement and there's always been this battle of which one's which. And, and I always think it's a synergy between the two. It's not one or the other. Um, and there are a lot of people out there I can think of like this. You know, I mean, who knew Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King before we knew Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King? They, they were created by the movements that swirled around them, but they became the leaders. And there are a lot of people in Baltimore, I, I, I hate to call out names, but I can, there's, there's a bunch of folks in this town who I think are in their communities who are just doing incredible work. And any one of them could be like that. I mean, they're out there. It's just, because things are like flukes. Look, I mean, I don't think they, those, those, things, those things aren't necessarily planned. You know, it's like, <clears throat> I didn't plan to be on the radio. It really was an accident. But I took advantage of the accident and built this radio career. Um, and that's what will happen with movements too. People will come up who will be seen because they're gonna lead things, you know, and, 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 and I can, I mean, there's a number of people, young and old. I was with a bunch of people today. I was in a room before I came here. I was with a group of, uh, a, a racially mixed group of housing activists from all across Baltimore City. And they are coming up with plans to confront the system with what the alternatives can be. And in that group, there are two or three, four people who could be the people who pop up next to be the person who leads that battle, or who is the face of that battle, you know? Um, and, you know, and so you, and it can take all kinds of ways. I mean, it's, when I gave this, I ran a panel the other night at the Morgan School of Architecture, which is an incredible school. I mean blew my mind the stuff they're doing at the School of Architecture at Morgan. But, so one of the things they're doing is, is you get in this media work, you can connect people. So the people at Morgan who want to be working on social justice can now meet the housing activists and they can actually sit together and figure out how they want, how they think neighborhoods should be designed. And actually have them, this is what it looks like. And working with young architects who say, we're gonna build, the, this is what you can do here. This is what their farm can look like, this is what this apartment can look like. You know, that's, but who comes out of that? I don't know. It could, it could be anybody. They're just going to, they, they will pop up. They will be here. They will be here. They might be in here. Might be right here. I might be looking at you right now. <laughs> um, so let's thank Mark for coming to Thank you. you.